Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this CHK webinar on climate resilience in Hong Kong today. I'm Tung Fung, Director of the Institute of Future Cities and Chair of the Department of Trophy and Resource Management at CHK. I have pressure to host this event today together with my colleague, Professor Mi Kam Ng, Program Director of the Urban Studies Program, and also Associate Director of the Institute of Future Cities. Today's webinar is part of the worldwide campaign, Soft Climates by 2030, which is a global dialogue of 125 events engaging local experts across the globe to address climate change. 2030 is the target year set by the United Nations to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. It is an action plan for everyone. We need to take immediate actions to combat the climate crisis. Otherwise, we may have to come across uh, extreme weather, floods, droughts, sea level rises, so on and so forth by 2030. The consequences can be disastrous. At this point, I would like to share my screen to highlight some of the works that CHK is working in terms of our sustainable development work. CHK is a public institution at Hong Kong. We are committed to address global grand challenge of climate change by promoting sustainability through teaching, research, and community engagement. As a local leader in sustainability, we co-host the Hong Kong chapter of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solution Network, which aims to mobilize university, research centers, knowledge institutions, civic society organizations to focus on practical problem solving for sustainable development and to localize and advance the SDG goals. In education, we have built into our education curriculum contents that present relevant and actionable knowledge for our students to cultivate their sense of environmental protection and sustainability. All the 17 SDG goals are addressed by some 40 general education courses, as well as courses offered by various departments across all eight faculties of the university. In terms of research, we have interdisciplinary institutions they are dedicated to generate innovative and impactful knowledge to address climate change and global warming and other issues, including the Institute of Future Cities, the Institute of Environment, Energy and Sustainability. Our research spans from smart and resilient urban design, smart transport for mobility, renewable energy, power grid storage and consumption. In terms of community engagement, CHK established the world's first museum of climate change, the CHK Jockey Club Museum of Climate Change, to promote education in environment and sustainability among the public by offering free access to an interactive multimedia exhibition that showcases variable collections and the latest information about climate change. Within CHK, we embrace policy, plans and programs to ensure sustainable development on our campus. We are the first tertiary institution to have conducted a campus environmental audit. We also adopted a campus master plan under which sustainable campus is one of our prime principles. All in all, we are working towards a carbon neutrality by 2038, hoping that we can go ahead of both the Hong Kong government as well as the central government of China. At this point of time, perhaps I will stop the share of my PowerPoint and we are going to show you a video on soft climates by 2030 campaign. So the video will start right away. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. 
My name is Eben Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're gonna discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice and how you can be a part of the solution. But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project has easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. It only takes courage. Don't take no for an answer. Ask them why not. This is your future. You'll be surprised how many teachers will say yes and thank you. Imagine you. Thousands of leaders like you around the world asking their teachers once every school term to make climate a class. That means every term going forwards, hundreds of thousands, millions of students worldwide in their classes talking about climate solutions. COVID has shown how fragile our global economy and society are to extreme events. It's also shown that vulnerable people are facing the hardest, most damaging impacts. This is also true with climate change. Science has made it clear that unchecked global warming will mean an unending onslaught of extreme events, causing untold suffering for humanity and all creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests and grasslands, and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. Okay, so um, in today's webinar, we'll try to explore what the government of Hong Kong, the private sector and civil society can do to foster climate resilience in Hong Kong. We are very honored to have experts in three sectors to share with us uh, their insights uh, on climate resilience. 
and they are our Mr. Wong Kam Seng, GBS, JP, Secretary for the Environment of the Hong Kong SAR government. And Dr. Jin Ng, she's the Director of CLP Research Institute, uh, China and Light Power Holdings Limited. And Dr. William Yu, he's the CEO of World Green Organization. There will be a discussion section following the three talks. You're welcome to ask questions through the Q&A box anytime during the webinar. Please do tell us your affiliated organization when you send in your questions. Some housekeeping rules. We are muting the video and microphone of the audience during the webinar. And the webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the internet after the event. Now, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ginny Ng. She's the director of CLP Research Institute. She's also the chair of the Hong Kong Institute of Qualified Environmental Professionals Limited. Dr. Ng has a decade of consulting experience in Hong Kong's environmental industry. She is one of Hong Kong's foremost experts in air and greenhouse gas emission inventories. Dr. Ng will share with us on how climate resilience is built in the power sector. Dr. Ng, please. Thank you, Mikam. And so let's see if technology works. Um, <laughs> all right, here we have it. Okay. So um, thank you uh, for inviting me to this very meaningful event. Uh, climate resilience is a very important topic. Uh, but of course, uh, for the power sector, one of the most important priorities uh, for us is mitigation. So just one little tiny slide on, in terms of mitigation and carbon reduction, sort of the importance of that in our sector is, is, is so urgent. Um, and so I did want to say that, uh, you know, there has been good news that compared to last year, because of the fuel mix change now coming into fruition and us transitioning from coal towards gas, uh, the carbon intensity uh, for Hong Kong customers of CLP uh, they've gone down quite a bit from uh, 0.5 kilograms per kilowatt hour to 0.37. So, you know, we think that's, that's good news, but we know there's still more to do. And of course, uh, at the group level, because we also have assets in other places around the world, including Australia, uh, China, and India, again, we're moving towards trying to reduce uh, coal capacity and moving towards a cleaner generation, more renewables. Uh, and, you know, of course, in the longer term, we see uh, storage hydrogen uh, also be in that far future. Uh, and so this point we wanted to highlight because uh, we know that there might be quite a few online who are customers of ours, especially uh, CUHK itself. So uh, that means your carbon footprint also has gone down, all right, for the 2020 uh, total emissions. Um, in terms of the power sector, I, you know, here I wanted want, what I wanted to really emphasize was more the importance of the fact that different climate impacts will result um, in uh, uh, impacts across, you know, different parts of the power sector value chain, whether it is generation, whether it is the transmission and distribution piece, or on the demand uh, customer side. And so here you can see, for example, even with uh, rising global temperatures, uh, that could affect the efficiency of our generation. Um, even there will be maybe a need for addition because you have peak, like therefore it means now we need even more capacity uh, to overcome and provide more cooling during the periods when you really need the, uh, re need the cooling. So actually the transmission, again, the efficiency could be affected. Uh, on the demand side, again, um, it could be both an opportunity as well as a risk. So I think that was another point I wanted to bring across that to some degree, uh, a lot of it, we talk about risk and we focus on that first, but I think it's also good to always try to think about the possible opportunities behind that risk. Uh, and if we look at a conceptual framework uh, for climate resilience for the electricity system, uh, you know, we look at sort of from the left to the right, first of all, the point of, of equilibrium, um, when everything is fine, everything is working properly, um, but there are gonna be slower long-term effects of climate change, such as sea, uh, sea level rise, for example. 
And because those are a bit long term, we may see that, you know, our actions in this area may be less or the investments in this area may be less. But what could be important is if we have new, uh, new builds or new projects, we should take that into consideration so we can even mitigate the longer term impact. So if we predict a new power station or a new uh, uh, solar power station, for example, is going to be built somewhere, we need to make sure that flooding or uh, you know, it's not in the, in the trail of a typhoon path coming through, then we actually have to look not at today's scenario, but project several decades if possible, or at least the next two decades, could the weather pattern change from what it looks like today? So whether we should build it there. So I think even trying to prevent um, building assets in places which may be prone or vulnerable to climate impacts will be quite important. And then as we move along to sort of the red and the purple side on the, on the right hand side, of course, we will try to do as much as we can to make sure uh, if, if, you know, power companies like us, we continue to reduce emissions as much as possible. Uh, but even then, there will still be uh, incidents of extreme climate weather conditions that will continue to happen. And whether they will be more frequent or whether they will be more severe or less severe, it will be different in different places, but they will happen. And as a result, the concept of resilience is important that you know, we do build in measures to make sure that we can recover quickly from these events, but also referring to my earlier point that, but also let's inform ourselves with that point that we need to build in a resilient way, that new builds need to actually be able to recover much quicker uh, than uh, maybe the original design. So if we look at this piece, um, the group has identified higher temperature and more heat events, uh, increased water scarcity and drought in some other parts of the world where we operate, such as India or Australia, and uh, more intense and frequent storms and floods. So for example, in, in Asia, that is also quite possible. As a group, you know, these are the typical uh, impacts that we, you know, we, we have identified. Now, throughout the years, uh, a range of measures have been put in place along CLP's uh, value chain to help us prepare for such climate events. And again, you know, they need to be all across all of our activities, whether it's generation, transmission and distribution, uh, and, and service recovery on the retail side. And so for Hong Kong, I did want to emphasize a little bit more since, you know, um, uh, in Hong Kong, we do, we have a very sort of unique position. Uh, we have identified uh, lightning, super typhoons, storm surges, and high temperatures as sort of the critical or the, the most significant impacts that we really need to have measures uh, built in to manage. Um, and so, for example, for super typhoon, we do, we do drills, we do studies on a regular basis. And as a result of them, we have strengthened our, uh, our towers. We have strengthened our foundations and, and, and put built in slope enhancements. Um, and also, you know, we have emergency restoration systems, which are actually temporary towers that we can, you know, if there is one that, you know, is not working, but we need electricity right away, at least we can have temporary one put in right away to make sure connections continue as we repair the other part. So storm surge, flood, you know, so of course measures to make sure our power stations and our substations are not flooded, high temperatures. Again, you know, I think everybody knows globally the average is going to go up. Now, I just wanted to bring out today, um, sort of typhoon, super typhoon Menka was one of probably the most uh, impactful typhoons we've had in the last few years. And so um, the good news from this was, you know, we, the measures that I just spoke about because we already had them in place, uh, we didn't have as much damage to our own systems. So in fact, even with the flooding mitigation, um, we had over 20 substations that were completely okay, even in this situation. So it was because we had those measures in place. But having said that, you know, we do have room for improvement. And I think from that, um, uh, from that um, uh, incident, or, or basically what Super Typhoon Menka has, has really uh, highlighted to us is the importance of establishing interface with government agencies for emergency support. I think that is critical that, you know, how do we do that right away as soon as possible, establishing that communication. And then there are times when everyone is so busy, even government 
is very busy. The fire services department, you know, is so busy, overwhelmed. Police are overwhelmed. Everyone's communication channels are overwhelmed that you get to a point where you can't there. No one will help. No one can help you, even if they want to. And as a result, we will need to build our own capacity to fix the problem ourselves. So when there were fallen trees and we were trying to access places, now we know, now we've had courses to teach some of our staff to actually saw the trees away. How do we clear the trees away so that we actually can make a pathway and get to our customers? Um, be more aware of our upstream and downstream impacts of climate. I mean, we may say, okay, we've got ourselves all protected, but actually if we don't, if we're not aware of the upstream supply and our clients or our customers also having issues or problems, if we can actually put measures in, in place earlier on so that we are more connected and more resilient as a whole, it benefits us too. Um, staff, so again, you know, staff traveling to work, we finally, you know, again, this was something that we realized, actually we could save a lot of time and a lot of hassle for a lot of the staff if we actually managed to give them um, accommodation or better transport to make sure they can uh, be near or to work uh, during these, these sort of critical periods. And of course, using technology, smart meter installation for remote villages or for everyone. So we do have a system that's going in place, uh, a seven year period where everyone will be fitted with smart meters. And if that happens, that will really help us uh, move forward in terms of understanding the damages or potential areas where we need to go and help in, emergent, in times of emergencies. And this brings me to this sort of second last slide about the importance of communications. And I think this is where, uh, you know, as engineers, we're very good at, you know, generating electricity, make sure you have it. But, you know, constant, regular communications with our customers to let them know this is what's going on. If you're in this area, you might have an issue. It's coming online. Please wait. Um, and I think that is so important because, again, we had the experience of all the lines, all the communications lines were actually flooded to the point where people couldn't even dial in. So how can they get information from us? And that was something we learned. So at the end of the day, one key point about the importance of self-reliance during adverse events was something that we learned. And I think it's a good thing because as more of us learn to be self-reliant and to actually help solve the problem you know, on the spot, as opposed to you know, calling someone else and asking someone else to come in, it will build more resilience capacity within the community. So whether it's the government, um, you know, as we said, look, government, public bodies, they're going to be flooded. And it's not they don't want to help. They can't, like, there's, they can't, you know, they're so busy. And then there's also the communications channels. What if external public communications channels go down? You know, what, what can we do? What measures should be in place so that we can communicate more regularly uh, across, the, across the chain? So with that, thank you so much. Um, for your attention. Uh, we will continue to work on climate adaptation and resilience measures, and we look forward to working more closely with the community and with the government so that Hong Kong becomes a very climate resilient city. Well, thank you, Tini, for a very uh, informative uh, uh, summary of works that involve uh, in, in combating the climate resilience uh, uh, in the power industry. As a matter of fact, uh, in Hong Kong, I think we enjoy quite a stability in terms of power supply despite the fact that uh, we do have a flooding and sometimes a heavy rainfall due to typhoons and so forth. So all the preparation work is important. I uh, uh, should particularly mention about the long-term impact uh, planning, which is essential for most in industry uh, in, in Hong Kong, particularly for the power industry. Certainly we will look forward to other discussions. Uh, I think that some of the audience also raised uh, the questions. Uh, we'll have the questions afterwards, okay? Um, so may I just want to introduce our second speaker Dr. William Yu. Uh, Dr. Yu is a founder and CEO of the World Green Organization, an independent non-governmental organization in Hong Kong, concerned with environmental conservation and environmentally related uh, livelihood and economic affairs. Dr. Yu is an energy economist and also a climate professional. He has variable regional management experience and has published international academic journals covering energy policy, indoor built environment, and green manufacturing. He also served in various committees in environmental protection, time planning, and sustainability under the Hong Kong SAR government. So Dr. Yu today will talk about how to get the community ready to build urban resilience in the face of climate crisis. Dr. Yu, please. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Fong. Um, oh, let me share the screen first. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks again for inviting me to this important event. Um, my great pleasure here. So I will talk about the capacity building for our community. So um, before I get started, some advertising time for our previous work, like uh, we have organized IPCC report update with several universities and experts from Hong Kong Observatory uh, expert and back to a few years ago. And also some environmental forum we organized for the secondary school. Um, for business corporations, um, we produce a report, a long report um, on potential climate risk, physical risk, and contacting um, stakeholder engagement. So, uh, but can be better if it comes with computer modeling and quantitative uh, projection. Um, so World Green Organization, our NGO believes green finance, so which is an important pillar to make paradigm shift in the carbon reduction landscape. So this is a conference co-organized with uh, the United Nations a year ago. So different types of programs ranging from green office to tree planting to plastic bottles, uh, we have uh, collected uh, over 2 million uh, PED bottles for recycling already. Um, so as we all know, um, cities are where the majority of the world's population lives. And it also means cities are highly exposed to the climate risk and multidimensional uh, disaster. So um, rapid uh, uh, urbanization will bring about 66% world population to urban areas by 2030. So compared to, you know, currently only 55%. So we need we really need to understand how all these risks will affect our livelihood and economic development in the future. Uh, I, I don't want to confuse you, but I just want to say, you know, uh, that covers a lot of aspects. So urban resilience embraces the concept of uh, climate change adaptation, mitigation, and disasters risk uh, reduction. So the approach is how we can choose to adapt to survive in face of all these volatile source and stress. Uh, we cannot take one single action to make the city resilient to climate change. That must be achieved by multiple numbers of hard and soft measures built over time. So all also engaging diverse perspective through multi-stakeholders process. So it's a very dynamic process we gain feedback, we try to uh, improve, and then we go back into the loop to collect all the information. So to get started, uh, maybe we can um, make good use of this, um, you know, uh, slide. Uh, there are five aspects uh, we, we need to communicate with people in the process, okay, to get them ready to face the, you know, climate impact. So um, they need to know, you know, uh, what are what will be the possible scenarios in the future. Uh, say, for example, understanding vulnerability. Um, the first one is related to people's experience. We hope the public will care more about climate change, right? Um, however, their response sometimes are highly correlated to their own experience. The more real experience they have in facing those climatic disasters, the more they are willing to take action. They are more willing to be engaged. If they cannot see, they cannot feel all this exposure, uh, even the warming weather, okay, or, or some kind of flooding, those climatic impact, they will be less responsive as expected. So uh, we need to also get the right party, right people, right institution to uh, involve. So, um, so as you can see about the rules and norms and beliefs, I, I think that's very important. You know, um, it's not limited to the level of awareness. So let, let me ask you one question. Oh, we, you have over uh, 100, 200 people here. So in Hong Kong context, okay, if now a big earthquake, earthquake happen. Okay, what will you do? A, 
leave the building and pop down to the street. Okay, going to an open area. B, hide under the table. Okay, I have a table here, hide, hide under the table. C, hide inside the, uh, maybe you are at home, your, your uh, wardrobe, okay? Hide inside, okay? Open the door and hide inside. Okay, uh, put your answer in your chat box, A, B, and C. Okay, um, what, what are the results? A, B, and C, okay. Oh, some say B, 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 quite a number of people B. Okay, I asked this uh, before in a different forum. Um, only one third of people uh, chose the right right answer, okay. Um, so we, we should go for B, right, high under the table. Um, because you get some protection over your head, okay, to you just in case some stuff, you know, hurt your head, okay? So you need a kind of protection. Um, but imagine if you ask a Japanese, okay, he or she can easily give you the answer. But in Hong Kong, we are not in the earthquake area. So so we, we really don't care about this and uh, we seldom discuss about this, right? So what I want to say is, um, Okay. Uh, you know, um, we need to know about, you know, uh, what will happen and how this will impact, you know, our future about all this climatic disaster. And we need, need to build a new construct, a new norm, a new knowledge system. Maybe you can argue, okay, from a perspective, uh, okay, we don't need all this uh, in place, say for example, infrastructure, uh, that, that might happen only once a hundred years. So should we build a very costly infrastructure to prevent this? You, you might argue. But I, I think uh, we need to start to, you know, uh, to build this system for ourselves about the possible impact in the future. Just like the new normal after pandemic, you and me now know about the structure and standard of face masks, right? How many layers? You know that. You heard about BFE, PFE, ASTM, all these terms. Okay, so we also need a new normal, a system, norms and beliefs and construct for, you know, the future climate resilience. Okay, so uh, I want to put more emphasis, you know, with uh, with all this uh, background of climate change based on academic research, our extreme weather events will be in intensified, okay, in the future, although de depends on, still depend on the geographic location. So I, what I want to ask is how to engage our community with all this? Is our mindset, you know, ready to cope with the future possible scenario? Is our infrastructure ready to sustain the operation? Actually, power outage is not difficult. Uh, it's, it's not uh, in the middle uh, of the midnight, okay? It's, it's, uh, it happens when the trees fall down, chip in the power line. So to prevent all this power surge, you know, the potential mechanism of those transmission system will react, okay? So it's not difficult. And also in the past, when you design a parking space or a car park, you will not associate it with a swimming pool, you know, able to house a large amount of water, okay, on the right-hand side, um, upper hand, okay. You don't need to install a pump, a pump, okay, to remove the, the water that floods in, right? But what, what will you do in the new normal in the future? Although the level of impact brought by all these extreme weather or climate change can be very different compared to the past. And even the subway station, you know, got floods spending 600 million US to rebuild. Okay, we are in a modern city with advanced technology, but it happens. 
Okay, so are we prepared? Our mindset, our infrastructure, our culture, all this, are we ready? Okay, Hong Kong, uh, you know, are we safe or vulnerable? Which one? So in the past, we had some small incidents, not very serious, uh, cause of tunnel get flat, but seldom uh, MTR, uh, manageable, I would say. But how about our neighboring areas, our neighborhood, uh, you know, that supply us energy, meat, vegetables, if they get hard hit by climate change, will Hong Kong be affected? So um, not only think about ourselves, the direct impact, but also the indirect impact. Uh, Hong Kong government in the past has done some changes in infrastructure to cope with some situations and also, you know, to cope with the changing demographic, uh, different types of impact. And also some multiple impact in the future, storm surge, high tide, many, many others. So as mentioned uh, by Ginny also, um, you know, the super typhoon, the Manhattan, you know, it's not long ago. So 60,000 reports of fallen trees. How to cope with that? Uh, what, what I want to say is, um, are we ready? Uh, do we know what will happen in the past? Okay, although people now are more aware of the needs to care about climate change, but uh, we need to involve different people, different aspects to look at the system, to look at the process, to look at the infrastructure, both hardware and software. Okay, um, sometimes we, we cannot really just look at the infrastructure. You also need to look at the, you know, like the food supply, the health implication. So um, all this social system, um, economic system, your supply chain, you know, um, now all these are interrelated and one failure can cause a chain effect to another. So um, what can we do and how do we start? Start from where? So I think finally we need to get people, Hong Kong people or the people um, in uh, the world to know what kind of risk they are going to face, who and what is at most at risk. Do we know in Hong Kong, who are the most vulnerable, which parts are the most vulnerable? So um, what are the possible consequences and the degree of impact? Okay, so um, for the first part awareness, you know, uh, we need some kind of analysis. If you look at the some kind of uh, exercise done by the other countries, cities, for example, um, climate change orientation, exposure analysis, sensitivity analysis, adaptive capacity measurement, uh, some kind of mentoring, uh, you know, coaching session. So, and also, um, you know, adapting, co coping, what kind of prevention, adaptation, recovery, and remedy should be in place? So you need uh, to let the people choose. Uh, there are different types of, uh, you know, solutions. So then followed by maybe city consultation, focus group, hotspot assessment, different types of, you know, work need to coordinate to bring people together. So how long does it plan to implement? What are the policy implications? So uh, how to, what uh, should be in place? What kind of measures to do the transformation? So it's quite complicated, I would say. Um, that involves re resources allocation, also conflict to compete for resources. Which sector should benefit first? Which part should do the prevention first? Fairness, 
equality. So um, I think lots of lots of questions, but uh, I, I will leave it to, to the government to think about. As you can see, all this survey, uh, only like 10%, 20% people will think uh, the individuals are accountable you know, for all these changes. So the remaining will all go to the government. You know, you should be the government to handle all these climate impact. Maybe the public utilities will share part of it. But, you know, um, I think uh, it's uh, an exercise that must involve every stakeholder, everybody. Okay, all of us will be affected by uh, all this climate disaster. Especially, I, I can see, as you can see, a World Green Organization involved in green finance. We believe uh, we need to Im involve private sector you know, uh, to leverage their strength and resources. We have some uh, green finance, you know, new um, uh, financial instrument like catastrophic bonds, you know, all this uh, to convert, you know, the gray infrastructure to green infrastructure some PPP, public private partnership program to speed up all these changes. So we have uh, lots of lots of work to do. We rely on technology, but also we rely on the finance instrument to yes. make changes. Thank so, you, William. It's a very uh, interesting talk. Mm. And I'm uh, mindful of the time since uh, 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 okay. we're gonna uh, it's really, uh, uh, well, have to follow a strict time schedule. But anyway, your, your talk has been very insightful, particularly you bring up uh, very important questions about uh, 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 are we prepared, okay? I think at different levels, uh, even different industries or, 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 or societies like, like your World Green or Green organizations and, and a similar organization are um, more knowledgeable of, of all the uh, uh, issues and problems. But certainly, how are we going to communicate with different stakeholders, uh, uh, both of the education institutions, uh, 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 private uh, sectors, the, uh, industry sectors, and, and, the, and, and the government? We have different roles to play. At this point of time, uh, uh, shall I uh, invite our uh, third speaker, Professor uh, uh, well, Mr. Wang Gam Singh? Okay. Uh, he, Mr. Wong assumed the post of a uh, Secretary of Environment since uh, 2012. Uh, in the past few years, he has launched and updated a number of uh, important policy groupings uh, concerning climate actions, biodiversity, air quality, waste management, and energy saving. I think that uh, we saw a lot of uh, uh, very fruitful uh, uh, products uh, based on his work and also, also his teams. And uh, particularly some of the new infrastructure that has been put in place, uh, like the tea park and as well as uh, those organic waste or treatment plants. Uh. But without further ado, uh, uh, Mr. Wong will talk about our carbon neutrality uh, uh, targets. So Mr. Wong, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Fung, uh, BKM, uh, dear friends. Thank you for organizing this uh, very meaningful event. Uh, I had the Earth Day uh, this year. And also the selection of speakers is very good, representing the three P highlighted by the Paris Agreement, the public sector, i.e. the government, the, uh, the public sector representing the government, private sector representing say power companies and all companies, and then people, that means everyone as mentioned by William. Today, I will talk with you about our journey towards carbon neutrality in Hong Kong. Mikam asked me what the government has been doing to prepare Hong Kong to face climate crisis in the future. We are already in the middle of the crisis and we've been working to make Hong Kong and Hong Kong people more ready to deal with the crisis. Climate resilience is a general term. It means probably cover three aspects under ARM, Adaptations mean how to make our infrastructure more climate proof and to resist the extreme weather and impacts. Resilience could be defined as the operations that can reduce the damage to the life 
and properties during extreme weather and then recover as soon as possible. Mitigations mean decarbonization, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to prepare an ARM arm so that we can be more ready to deal with the crisis. I would like to start the journey in 2015, before the COP21, that is the United Nations Climate Conference held in uh, Paris at that year. Before the COP21, the Hong government has been doing preparation, at least two aspects. One is to launch Hong Kong's first ever energy saving plan for Hong Kong's built environment, 2015 to 2025 plus, to set a more aggressive target to reduce energy consumption in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is one of the members of APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. They have a target, but for our energy saving plan, we set an even more aggressive target on energy saving. In fact, if we use the energy intensity as the indicator, Hong Kong's performance is the best among all the APEC economies. And before the COP21 conference, we also revealed what we've been doing in Hong Kong about adaptation, about resilience and mitigation, and published the Hong Kong Climate Change Report 2015, and also engaging the younger professionals and people to share their vision, their desire about how to deal with climate change. I represent Hong Kong to join the national team to attend the COP21 in Paris. After the conference, we are glad to see the Paris Agreement. So what should Hong Kong to do further? In early 2016, we, the Hong Kong government, set up a high-level steering committee chaired by the number two within the government and also attended by all the ministers from all the relevant bureaus in the Hong Kong government. In fact, it includes all ministers within the government because it affects education, affects the technology, affects safety, uh, we have to use innovation technology, you name it, everything. So it's one of the structure that we built up to make Hong Kong more ready to deal with climate change. And then within a year, we published Hong Kong's Climate Action Report, a climate action plan 2030 plus, comprehensively set a new target and also actions on adaptation and resilience. It's a comprehensive blueprint. And we are following the track of the action plan on decarbonization and others. And then within that year, we also follow up on the action plan, including the 40 partnerships. I interpret the Paris Agreement under 40s because it should involve targets and then timeline because we have to say decarbonize within certain time frame. Otherwise, it will be too late. So it's about targets, timeline, and also we have to make the data transparent to disclose what we are targeting to do. And then we have to work together. So targets, timeline, transparency together are referred as the four T's. So we ask all the big organizations in Hong Kong to follow the four T partnership to make their own decarbonization targets within certain timeline and make their actions transparent and we work together. And the Hong Kong government sets the example. For instance, in a four, a five year time frame, we will deal say 6% of the total electricity consumption within the Hong Kong government buildings. So with this example and ask others to follow so that we can work together. It's not only about the government, not only about the companies, but also about everyone. So in 2018, 
we launched Hong Kong's low carbon living calculator. It can empower everyone in town to measure their own carbon emissions. They can measure it, assess it in relation to their daily living, including clothing, food, living, and travel in the past year. And there are tips to advise you how you can further decarbonize. And also in 2018, we made a new agreement with the two power companies in Hong Kong and implemented it since late 2018. It's called a scheme of control agreement in Hong Kong. It's one of the greenest scheme of control agreement in Hong Kong. There are many green features from launching Hong Kong's renewable energy fit-in tariff, FIT, that is to provide incentive to individuals communities and the private sector to install, say, solar panels in their properties so that they can earn suitable reward and to improve the renewable energy mix in Hong Kong. The response has been very encouraging. Now more than 14,000 applicants submitted to the two power companies. About 90% of them approved it. And the total power generation can power say around 60,000 households in Hong Kong. And also we are riding on that to launch a solar harvest scheme funded by the government is to help schools and relevant NGOs to install solar panels so they can generate renewable energy at the same time to educate the young people about decarbonization and renewable energy. As mentioned by other speakers in the 2017 and 18, Hong Kong was attacked by two consecutive super typhoons. We learned from them, from, from those experience, so that we would upgrade our climate adaptation and resilience plan through different uh, departments and agencies within the government, and also involving the power companies and other utility companies. I can share with you a story here, because we would like to extend the renewable energy generation in Hong Kong on public buildings and public lands. But you know, Hong Kong is a tiny city in terms of the area. So we have to install, say, floating solar panels on top of the restaurants or the bodies. We installed it, two pilot schemes in two restaurants in Hong Kong. But shortly after that, Hong Kong was attacked by two super typhoons. They survived it with minimal damage and we learn from those experience so that we can make our scheme more resilient when we're going to expand the scheme of the floating PV in Hong Kong in order to generate more renewable energy. In 2019, we, through the SDC, the Council for Sustainable Development to engage the public about how to set the strategy for long-term decarbonization for Hong Kong. We got the report uh, later, and the report is supportive to deep decarbonization. It recommended seven aspects, lifestyles, education, training, and research, built environment, clean and zero carbon energy, green transport, city planning and management, and green finance. So the government would make reference to those recommendations to prepare for the upgraded climate action plan. Last year, um, we got the report from the SDC, and shortly after that, the chief executive of Hong Kong SAL, through her policy address, announced that Hong Kong would strive towards carbon neutrality before 2050. In Hong Kong, in 2014, we already reached the peak of the carbon emissions in Hong Kong. And now we are decreasing the carbon emissions year by year. And with the announcement, we are going to update and upgrade our climate action plan towards carbon neutrality. At the same time, we are launching new schemes in order to walk through the journey towards carbon neutrality. An example is that in late 2020, we launched Hong Kong's Green Tech Fund because in order to have deep decarbonization, we need the academia, companies, 
uh, etc., to help to consider relevant innovation and technologies in Hong Kong so that we can meet our carbon neutral goal. This year, we are also launching a number of environmental blueprints to support the forthcoming upgraded climate action plan. Look at the carbon footprint in Hong Kong. There are a few key aspects. The biggest share is about the power generation and consumption, accounting for more than 60%. And then around 20% in relation to transport. And then the remaining is mainly about waste management. So early this year, we upgraded Hong Kong's waste blueprint for Hong Kong up to 2025. And then recently, we launched Hong Kong's first ever roadmap on the popularization of electric vehicles. All these blueprints are supportive to the forthcoming climate action plan 2050. At the same time, we formed a team zero within the government involving people from the environmental production department and also other relevant departments so that the younger colleagues can work together to look into the global relevant technologies and innovations that can help Hong Kong go towards carbon neutrality and better environment. This shows the leaflet of the waste movement for Hong Kong. At the same time, we highlight that we have another environmental goal is zero municipal solid waste at landfill by around 2025. So the carbon neutrality is the main driver. At the same time, we'd like to improve the environment at the same time and create green jobs supporting the green recovery in Hong Kong. Colleagues talk about the COVID-19 pandemic affecting Hong Kong and worldwide. At the same time, we are stepping up measures to go towards carbon neutrality at the same time to deal with, say, the waste, uh, generation in relation to the pandemic. We're having more single-use plastics. At the same time, we launched Hong Kong's recycling stores. It's a brand new idea with the incentive card, loyalty card that can attract more people while asking them to reduce waste at source at the same time to do cleaner recycling, including various types of plastics. The response has been encouraging. I encourage Hong Kong friends to visit one of the 22 recycling stores in Hong Kong. We also try out, are going to try out the RVM, the reverse weighting machine, okay, to have the keen recycling of the beverage bottles so that they can be turned into resources. This is the roadmap on popularization of electric vehicles. We are setting a deadline for the sales of new private vehicles by around or before 2025. At the same time, we set the goal towards zero vehicle emissions before 2050 to tie in with the carbon neutrality timeline. This is the logo we just decided and will be formally launched it by the Earth Day next week. Okay, this is the first time that I saw it properly. Um, it would like to focus people within the government and also with the private sector and also ever in time because in order to meet the carbon, the carbon neutral goal is a core order. We have to work together under the three P's. And the forthcoming climate action plan 2050 will include the updated actions on adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. In the past few years, relevant departments are working together to see how we should say upgrade the climate adaptation strategies based on the super typhoons experience, uh, Given the rising temperatures in Hong Kong and globally, we are basing on the latest scientific data to upgrade our plan on adaptation and resilience. We would launch Hong Kong's updated climate action plan around the third quarter of this year. At the same time, as mentioned earlier, it's not only about zero carbon emissions before 2050. At the same time, we'd like to improve air quality in Hong Kong and reduce the waste and to improve the resources circulation in Hong Kong. So there are three zeros, zero carbon emissions, zero vehicular emissions, and zero municipal waste landfill in the future in Hong Kong. It's a tall order. We have to work together. And this is the link, www.climateready.gov.hk that contains 
the most relevant information about climate actions in Hong Kong. I welcome you to visit the website and we have to work together to be climate ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong, uh, for this very uh, informative uh, uh, summary on works that uh, uh, the, the government has done uh, for the last few years. Uh, uh, now, the, the carbon neutrality is something that, which is very aggressive and uh, the plan all attached with it are also very important uh, in terms of the tech fund, in terms of the e-vehicle ways and all sorts of everything. Uh, we do have a very, uh, um, well, uh, warm uh, response from the audience. So I just want to, first of all, thanks all the speakers for their talks. And it's time to take questions from the audience. So perhaps uh, I may want to grab one question from the audience, okay. Um, perhaps um, just combine some of the questions together, okay. For instance, uh, 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 COP26 is coming uh, uh, to take place in Glasgow. Uh, what will be our government's role in participating in that conference? And also some of uh, our colleagues are also mindful about uh, how is Hong Kong's plan working together with those in uh, Greater Bay Area? And how are we going to uh, plan our own plan uh, uh, take into consideration of the national plan as well? Okay. Perhaps I, 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 I throw this first question up first uh, to Mr. Wong. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Fung. It's a very meaningful and timely question. My simple answer is that according to the Paris Agreement, that uh, each economy should reveal their climate action plan every five years. So as presented in my earlier slide, we are doing exactly the same, okay? We have the earlier climate action plan 2030 plus. And within this year, before the COP26, uh, we would launch Hong Kong's updated climate action plan with the key target towards carbon neutrality before 2050. Hong Kong is uh, one of the special administrative regions of China, and China also made a pledge to go towards carbon neutrality before 2060. Okay, I would like to pick uh, before 2030. As I said earlier, Hong Kong's emissions has already peaked around 2014, and we are going towards de decarbonization. So we are more or less following the uh, China's uh, overall target. But you know that within China, there are cities and economies that can work faster, uh, including Hong Kong. So that's why we'd like to demonstrate that Hong Kong could be one of the leading cities uh, to uh, be uh, have, having the deep decarbonization and also having the adaptation and resilience measures updated. Lastly, about the Greater Bay Area, it's a very good question. We are working closer with the GBA on various environmental aspects on improving air quality, on deal with the resources circulation, and also how to share knowledge and strategies to make the Greater Bay Area uh, with the deep decarbonization and also to make the area and region more adaptive and resilient in terms of the climate. Thank you. All right, so I can see uh, two, two questions, uh, one for Dr. Ng and one for Dr. Yu. Uh, Dr. Ng, uh, I think uh, there's a question that asks, how can a power company cut down, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emission? You know, how do you do uh, mitigation? And there's another question for Dr. Yu. Uh, you know, uh, the audience is very uh, interested to know, like besides uh, what you have mentioned, a green finance, uh, is there any international bank policy to deter or to sort of like, you know, do without these dirty investments? Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll start from a power company perspective. Um, the, the answers are, are very clear. Renewable energy, uh, shutting down coal, <laughs> uh, and ultimately, um, Really, if we do want to have more renewable energy, we will need more energy storage. Uh, nuclear power could be a part of the answer where it's possible. Uh, and, but where that leap from coal to renewables is not possible right away, like in Hong Kong, then using a transition, we would call a transition option, which is using natural gas, which is half the carbon intensity of coal, that that is a transition option. But we also believe that even the gas needs to transition towards a zero carbon 
type of carrier, such as hydrogen, could also be green hydrogen uh, produced by renewable energy. So we think in the very, very long term, um, you know, that will happen. So it's the, I think from the power generation perspective, it is painstakingly just keep changing, keep increasing our, you know, zero carbon capacity as much as possible or reducing uh, carbon emitting types of fuels as much as possible. Okay, um, let me respond to the question about the financial institution like banks, how they respond to all these. Um, I, I guess the dirty projects are uh, related to a kind of fossil fuel projects uh, using coal fire plant. Um, so I, I remember back to a uh, um, few years ago, um, 22 very big bank banking groups already announced, you know, they will uh, refuse to grant any kinds of loans arrangement, you know, providing financing to all these uh, project uh, containing like more than 10% of, you know, thermal coal projects. So um, they are trying to say no uh, to the traditional fossil fuel project in order to encourage more uh, new energy renewable project to come out. And that's uh, one, one uh, kind of move, especially um, back to the earlier days, uh, what we know about equator principles, you know, they, they have some kind of criteria set, you know, to green out uh, all these uh, un environmental unfriendly projects, uh, you know, by all these uh, financial institutions. And in recent days, ESG investing is very hot. Uh, very popular um, is a buzzword, you know, uh, compared to sustainability, maybe. Yeah, so, um, you know, all these uh, ESG report uh, putting emphasis on environmental performance uh, definitely will, you know, get the attention and uh, a kind of measurement uh, for the financial institution. And you, you remember now the green bonds, green loans, or sustainability linked loans, you know. Uh, banks will offer some kind of advantage, either, you know, the discount in interest rate when we make good use of all this green proceeds to do the green projects. So financial institution is trying to incentivize all this uh, kind of investment and commitment. Thank you. Then I follow up by some other questions. Okay. I can see that some audience are uh, quite uh, concerned about, uh, firstly, should Hong Kong set some uh, binding targets? Okay, we talk about carbon neutrality, but uh, should we set some more specific targets uh, so that uh, we, we we can see how we can reach those targets? And also, I could see that uh, there are some local concern about uh, the project on land out tomorrow. Okay, uh, would that be affects our carbon neutrality uh, if this plan of this is going to be launched? So I think the questions are addressed to. Mr. Wong. Okay, uh, Professor Fong, two questions. One is that we already have the very uh, clear 2030 decarbonization target, okay? Before that, we have the 2020 target, okay? We would have all the confidence to meet the 2020 target. And the next milestone would be 2030. So these are all very clear and concrete when compared with other economies in Asia. And the 2050 is another very clear target. Okay, so we have short term, medium term, and long term. And more details will be uh, uh, described in the forthcoming climate action plan 2050. Regarding all new developments in Hong Kong, I think there are probably two concerns. One is about the impact on the overall carbon emissions. Second, is about Hong Kong's adaptation and resilience in relation to climate. I have to tell you that on one hand, we have the social and economic needs. For instance, we need more housing, in particular public housing, okay? So wherever we are going to build those homes, okay, people would consume powers and generate carbon emissions, okay? So no matter it's on an island or in the new territories, uh, among the bound fuel size, they are similar. But if there are new development areas, 
we would push the relevant bureaus and departments to meet, to make those new development areas as green as possible. So go towards near carbon neutral in the overall planning and design. That is the commitment within the government. At the same time, wherever they're located, we have to use the latest science to make the area to become adaptive. At the same time, to have the operational uh, de uh, device to make it receded. In fact, the most vulnerable areas in Hong Kong to be affected by the extreme weather are those existing urban areas near the coastal areas, like Han Fa Chun that uh, sung by um, William in, her, in his life. Those existing areas, actually when they were planned and decided, we, similar to many economists, didn't have the updated science about the extreme weather triggered by the climate change. So if I do have concern about those adaptation and resilience, the existing older urban areas, in fact, deserve more concern. Thank you. All right, uh, we do have a question from an undergraduate student from the Netherlands. She asked this question uh, more general. I hope all three of you can answer. Uh, can we fight climate change in our capitalist system with such focus on growth and wealth? If yes, how can the two be combined? Lady first. <laughs> you need to un unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, I was debating whether I was a lady or not, but okay. um, <laughs> uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think that has been one of the reasons why uh, action on climate has been slow because the, the, the financial or commercial gains from doing it obviously are not high compared to other alternatives. So what's happened is uh, financially, sort of the old carbon intensive ways or business models are still very uh, profitable. And so it's very hard to walk away from them and start to invest in a future that ultimately can be profitable, but it takes a decade or two of a lot of investment with no returns in between. And so that kind of concept obviously is quite challenging uh, for such a huge change to happen. But I am still very positive that change can continue to happen if we do it like i know i have friends who say i am an incremental innovation person and i said but that's because sometimes you just have to keep moving one step at a time but you got to keep doing it so that you can move like the whole mile and i think with climate change like many environmental issues this is going to be one of them but you know, obviously, William is the expert on you know being an economist, and I also think policies also have a very important role in being able to differentiate or level the playing field from a financial perspective. And so, over to uh, to William on this point. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Jenny. I, I think uh, some someone uh, some scholars uh, proposed the concept prosperity without growth. Right? You remember that. So um, seems uh, they they think uh, GDP is no longer the uh, the mere indicator, you know, for everything. Uh, however, uh, uh, we continue to make use of all these resources in order to generate, you know, the economic growth. So how how we can convert that is a, a big paradigm shift. No one's want to do it first, like Jenny mentioned. You know, um, but now I, I can see the changes is first how we can make good use of the policy to create a level playing field, fair to every business people. They can compete, you know, uh, on a, a, a equity basis. And also, um, you know, the circular economy um, concept is no longer a concept. I, I think uh, we, we, we are in the transition to that area. I, I can give you a very simple example, although it's rare, I would say, is uh, like interface, the carpet. They make good use of you know, all this recycling, the carpet, you know, uh, collecting back the carpets from, from their clients, you know, which result in 
uh, you know, reducing their electricity, water consumption, and material costs. Even they try to do some good to uh, collect back all the fish that the neon number six, the nylon number six, okay? And try to convert it to a kind of carpet material. So on the one hand, solve the problem, the ocean uh, waste problem. On the other hand, try to do some, uh, something good for the business. I, I think now it's no longer a concept. It's, uh, it can be implemented, but uh, it takes time, I would say. But now the trend is you see the green finance might help to speed up the transformation. The green technology, you need to overcome. You get through the hurdle of this technology interface spend more than 10 years to figure out the related technology. Sometimes that is a hurdle, but now you have the technology to move on. With all this in place, I, I will see a more faster change we, uh, in, in the business sector. Uh, hopefully um, before the disaster come, we really need to take real action. Okay, maybe we have uh, Mr. Wong's last word uh, before we wrap up the section. Okay, I think it's a very good question. Uh, three responses. Firstly, as mentioned in our waste plan for Hong Kong 2035, we are supportive to the circular economy. And I think uh, we can learn from some other economies like the Netherlands, uh, Denmark are uh, working uh, earlier about this concept. So we can have further exchange about that. Second, as mentioned by William, wind and sustainable finance would also affect uh, uh, our answer to the question. Hong Kong as an international finance hub uh, would write on that and, and promote more about green finance. Last but not least is that uh, we look at different countries, say um, about the journey from the carbon peak to the carbon neutrality in many capitalist economies, it took about 50 years, a long, long time. But we may look at say China, the time between its peak and carbon neutrality would be only about 30 years, okay, based on a different economic structure. So I think it's a very good example or observation. Uh, we would like to uh, look uh, uh, further and see how different structures in the economy, in the politics, how they can help to deal with this crisis, including the pandemic that we are facing different economies, different countries, there are different systems, but there are different levels of success in deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. I think uh, we all agree that we have a marvelous uh, discussion and we all learn from the governments that it's so important to take long-term perspective and cross policy collaboration in undertaking progressive measures to mitigate and adapt to climate crisis with set timeline. You know, we heard um, you know, our minister said it, uh, targets, good examples and continuous learning to rally citizens together to move towards uh, climate uh, resilient and also carbon neutral uh, cities. We also learn from the business sector, you know, that uh, we need to turn uh, climate crisis into opportunities for very creative, long-term, uh, mitigative, and also adaptive self-reliant responses across the value train, you know, like uh, Dr. Ng mentioned, and sensitive to location and asset types. And I really like, you know, that uh, they also pay attention to the well-being of their staff member when uh, they face this crisis. And for NGOs, uh, I can see that uh, it's so important for NGOs to build the capacity of civil society through local activities and international connections that, you know, these are very important and civil society needs to be culturally, you know, Dr. Yu reminded us uh, to be com competent and also knowledgeable, versatile key player in climate resilience to identify creative hardware and software solutions to transform our surrounding socioeconomic environment so that we can be really, you know, carbon neutral. He also reminds us that uh, this involves uh, resources allocation. And so there are uh, justice, social justice issues. But uh, we are very hopeful because we talk about prosperity without growth, circular economy, green finance, environmental sustainability, and also you know, social, uh, socially just, and, and that constitute our resilient cities. So I hope uh, this webinar has shown you know, us the importance of climate resilience 
that we all you know, can do uh, together with concerted efforts to combat this crisis and leverage you know, the, sit the situation to build a better and more sustainable future for the next generations. So the workshop today will serve as a learning tool for universities and secondary school students around the world. Actually, there are over 120 webinars uh, on the Soft Climate by 2030 websites. You can also visit the CHK Climate Webinar website to learn about what the others are doing. So let's work together to tackle climate crisis and build a sustainable future. Last but not the least, uh, on behalf of CHK, uh, we would like to give our heartfelt thanks to our speakers, Minister Wang Kam Seng, Dr. Jenny Ng, and Dr. William Yu. So to our audience, thank you once again for your joining of the webinar today. Uh, you know, if your questions are not addressed, and there are so many of them, you know, today, you can write to us. We, we hope I, we can follow up your questions with our speakers. So please send your inquiries to our email address indicated uh, on the web, webinar website. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.